Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you and uh, to share with you some of the ideas and what's going on in, in our region. And really, my, my expertise is in this binational region, what we call Calibaja, the Caliba California and Baja California binational mega region. And how we uh, really integrate and we can leverage each other's capabilities to become more competitive as one region. Now, Aaron was just mentioning about the 20th anniversary of NAFTA. So I just wanted to start off with that because it really gives us a, a context of you know, what's going on at the macro level. Uh, even though we've been doing it here in the region for, for, for 50 years, if at the national level, the actual integration and collaboration has been evolving uh, in the last 20, 20 years. And we can see how trade between the both countries has really increased and that has generated you know, millions of jobs and a lot of, a lot of uh, new opportunities for entrepreneurs and for new enterprises. But one thing that really um, strikes me is, and really reflects this integration, is the percentage of content of the imports coming from Mexico to the US. They have 40% US content. So it really is, that reflects how integrated we are. So there's uh, intellectual property materials, uh, technology going in one direction, finished goods going in another direction, and, and vice versa. So this really reflects how, as a region, a macro region, we're really integrated in becoming more competitive in, in Peru. And then the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which the U.S. Is, is also involved in. But these are new trade agreements that will help you know, continue to uh, expand our export markets and opportunities. Now, getting back to, to the Calibaja mega region, um, it's, just, it's not just Tijuana and San Diego, but it's really the whole county of San Diego, the whole county of Imperial, and the five municipalities of Baja California. Yeah, so it's Ensenada, Tecate, Mexicali, Rosarito, and Tijuana. So we all conformed uh, an organization. Uh, we actually have a 501c6 uh, here in San Diego, was uh, conformed last year. Um, with, the, with all of the partners being part of, uh, of this new organization. And the purpose of this organization is to market the region and market how together we're, we're more competitive and more attractive to a lot of uh, global industries. So these are the partner organizations. And really how it all started was, uh, well, we've, we've been you know, collaborating informally for many, many years, but this has been evolving into a, a how we can do more uh, proactive activities as a group. So we conform this uh, official organization and the whole purpose, as I said, is really to market the region. And as a region, we, we really become attractive. Um, you know, the, the whole US-Mexico border, uh, if you have, if you uh, integrate the economies of all the states uh, within the U.S.-Mexico border, the 10 states, we would be the sixth largest economy in the world. And the Baja Calibaja binational mega region is the largest concentration of population in the whole U.S.-Mexico border. So we're kind of the capital of this sixth largest economy of the world. Our combined GDP is 203. 214, and uh, with a, a workforce of almost 3 million people. So that really, just by itself, uh, the market dimension, uh, we, we become relevant in, in the landscape, in the world landscape. But we really stand out in some strategic sectors and as, as a region. The, re the sectors that we are the most uh, competitive in worldwide as, as a region are advanced manufacturing that includes aerospace, automotive, uh, biotechnology, electronics, defense, uh, medical devices, uh, maritime industry very strong uh, here in San Diego, but agribusiness, including the Imperial uh, County and the, the Mexicali Valley and the Ensenada Valley. Um, applied biotech, of course, San Diego is the leader, uh, but medical devices, the manufacturing part of that, uh, Baja California is very, very strong. Uh, it's, it probably has the highest concentration of medical device manufacturing workers in North America. And clean tech and, of course, logistics, you know, uh, a lot of the port, the airports, uh, the rail, 
we are, we are very well connected, the highways, et cetera. So the region is very well connected. Um, in some respects, a lot of people, uh, from the U.S. perspective, they see San Diego as, as the last corner. And from the Mexico City or Southern Mexico perspective, they see Baja California as the last corner. But when, when you look at it uh, from an international perspective, it's actually the middle, right? So it's, uh, we are very central to a lot of the, the capabilities of, of complementing our economies. I think I'm going backwards. Oh, OK. So the, some statistics of our demography, uh, the average age, you know, we, we're a fairly young population. Uh, this is an imperial county, so this is some of the assets within imperial county. As, as a collaborative effort, we try to, of course, uh, focus on the strengths and the assets of each partner within the, the Cali Baja initiative, you know, the, the San Diego County, Imperial County, and Baja, and try to really come uh, bring to light the strengths of those areas. And uh, Imperial County has become a very uh, important destination for uh, green energy uh, projects, uh, for actually producing electricity uh, with energy sources that are more uh, reliable, I'm sorry, uh, renewable. In Baja California, uh, the total population of the state is actually not that big, 3.3 million. Uh, the city of Tijuana has about 2 million uh, out of that, uh, that population. But the labor force uh, primarily focused on manufacturing. So this, the, about 60% of the labor force is in manufacturing. And of course, you know, we have ports. I don't know if you're, everybody's familiar with the Port of Ensenada, which is only about an hour and a half uh, drive south of the border. And it's a deep sea port that has container terminal and, and, and container cargo, as well as bulk for uh, agricultural and fisheries. And we have an international airport in Tijuana and Mexicali. And maybe you've heard of this uh, new project. I think I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Having a terminal on the US side that is connected to the Tijuana airport. And the industries, as I was saying, you know, advanced manufacturing is uh, the, the component that Baja California really brings uh, to, to the partnership. And uh, we have, um, at, the, at, the, at the region level, 280,000 workers. But just in Tijuana, there's about 170,000 uh, manufacturing workers. And some of the key uh, sectors that are the fastest growing worldwide. So we are um, competitive in the growth areas and the innovation areas and technology areas and worldwide. So that gives us a leverage and an opportunity. Um, we, in our website, the, the Calibaja partnership website, calibaja.net, we have an interactive um, asset map. So you can identify the sectors uh, by NIC codes uh, that you want to know, you know how much of that business is in the region, in the mega region. And you can map out you know, by sector you know, what companies are located within the mega region. Applied sciences, uh, you know, of course, uh, San Diego is a leader in research. You know that, I'll skip that one. <laughs> agribusiness, um, San Diego has a lot of agribusiness as well. I don't know how familiar you are, but there's a lot of agribusiness in San Diego. But the Imperial Valley and uh, the Mexicali Valley are one of some of the most productive uh, agro areas in, in the world. And uh, the Ensenada, the south of Ensenada as well. Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with the Guadalupe Valley. Anybody has been to the Guadalupe Valley? So we're producing a lot of wine. About 80 to 90% of the wine produced in Mexico is being produced just about an hour south of uh, the border here. And uh, a lot of those wines have been winning awards, uh, medals in Europe, in the US, and in Asia. Clean tech is uh, one of the growing industries, and not just in terms of renewable energies, but a lot of uh, the water treatment technologies and other types of uh, biofuels, uh, in, actually in the Imperial Valley, is uh, recognized as one of the best environments for, for algae production and biofuels. In logistics, as I said, you know, we have the two ports, uh, Ensenada and in San Diego. That gives us access to the Pacific. Um, a lot of the cargo uh, between the ports is uh, more a bulk type of cargo. Uh, some uh, construction materials, agricultural products, uh, fisheries. But there's some containerized uh, cargo. 
not a lot. Uh, coming into the port of Ensenada, I think it's about 300,000 uh, containers uh, per year, so it's a small operation. But uh, there's a potential for growth. Uh, there's a, a section of the, the Ensenada port called uh, El Sausal that is another uh, terminal that is going to be uh, expanded. And that has the potential to be uh, connected by rail uh, to, to the north. So that'll give another dynamic, and probably that could expand maybe up to a million containers in the future. Of course, uh, border crossings uh, is one of our um, choke points. You know, we have to continuously uh, improve the infrastructure. Uh, we're always lagging behind. Uh, welcome, James, James Clark, if anybody hasn't met him. Uh, James has been one of the, the most uh, vocal and organized uh, persons in uh, promoting better infrastructure in our cross, uh, to cross the border. Right now, uh, San Isidro is going through a $600 million uh, expansion and renovation project. Um, they're finishing up the phase one of the project. The, um, by the end of this year, should be completed. And then phase two and phase three have, uh, be, have received funding approval, right? Yes, so that's uh, kudos for, <laughs> for uh, the Smart Border Coalition uh, that uh, James heads. But um, also there's other uh, projects for commercial, uh, expanding the commercial crossing in uh, Otay Mesa. There's a project called Otay Mesa 2, uh, which would be a toll uh, crossing. It would be uh, paid, but it will give a lot more capability for us, especially for the commercial border crossing. Mexicali has uh, two border crossings. In total, there's six crossings. Uh, between Cali uh, Baja California and, uh, and California. Um, so there's, the dynamics is just very intense in terms of the traffic flow. So I wanted just to touch base on um, some of the, you know, the ideas of you know, what we can promote for the region and the, cap the complementary capabilities of the region and being able to have access to talent, yeah, like you guys, uh, the, some of the best universities available uh, in California, and also Baja California, you know, the CETIS University uh, is a private university in Tijuana that is uh, part of the, the Western Association of Colleges, so the same, uh, I would imagine, the same as USD. Um, so it, they're in the same type of uh, standards. Uh, and, and CETIS has uh, a lot of the engineering uh, degrees, and they're specializing in uh, uh, like aerospace and medical device manufacturing. So they're very specialized, and uh, that talent pool is very important that we can leverage. Uh, the clusters and supply chain opportunities. Uh, I've talked uh, before here in, uh, with the supply chain group uh, about those opportunities and how um, the manufacturing base uh, has, uh, is importing most of their components and raw materials from outside the region. So there's opportunities for local companies to be suppliers of that uh, manufacturing base. And it's, it's, and it's about, um, uh, this is in, in particularly in Tijuana, the, the size of the manufacturing base. Uh, we have close to 170,000 workers in the manufacturing sector. Tijuana is the number one, well Baja is the number one exporting manufacturing concentration in Mexico. Uh, and this is that, that our manufacturing facilities that are focused on uh, exporting to other countries. Uh, they, what used to be referred to as the Maquiladora uh, program, and now it's a different program, but it's still the same concept of uh, having multinational companies that do the final assembly and manufacturing in Mexico, but it's really for re-exporting to other countries. So Tijuana has the highest concentration of these type of companies uh, in, in nationwide. These are the sectors that we are focused on, or the, the ones that have the, the highest growth. Aerospace, automotive, medical, and electronics. Um, we have a, the Toyota manufacturing facility in, in Tijuana, just uh, started an expansion. Um, they're going to be doing up, up to 70,000 new uh, Tacoma pickup trucks in, in that facility. And if uh, one of the key infrastructure projects that we need to focus on is, as a region, is the rail connection uh, to the east, because uh, the rail that we have here um, goes south into Tijuana and north to LA, but it doesn't go to the east. So once it goes to Tijuana, then it goes to the east and comes back to the, to the U.S. in Tecate. So in that part of the, the, the rail line uh, uh, 
from Tijuana to Tecate and to the, to the main uh, rail connection to the east coming from Los Angeles has, uh, needs about $100 million in, in infrastructure improvements to be able to, um, to be used for uh, commercial applications. But if we do that, we'll be able to expand the automotive industry very quickly. Um, Hyundai just uh, started the, a new facility for a, f a foundry uh, of aluminum to do the caissons of uh, transmissions and motor blocks. And the next step, of course, is just putting together the transmissions and the motors. And then the next step is you know, building the automobile. So if we get that rail, run, uh, rail uh, going, uh, that type of investment will come to the region very quickly. And the automotive in industry has the, the highest value of the supply chain uh, opportunity. So there's you know, just billions of dollars that could be generated in the region of uh, potential supplies to that, to that sector. Then uh, medical devices, as I said, is the, the fastest growing uh, sector and probably the one that we have uh, the best uh, uh, complementary capabilities within the region. You know, with all the research uh, that is being done in San Diego and some of the manufacturing in medical devices. But we have companies in Baja California uh, and in Tijuana in particular that are from other parts of the world. Uh, so we can take advantage of that. We have a company from Iceland. It's probably one of the one, if not almost the only large manufacturing company from Iceland uh, that does uh, prosthetics. Uh, they do limbs and they do other, other types of uh, medical devices. And so that type of, uh, we have one from New Zealand, which is also kind of rare, uh, but we have companies from France, from England, and uh, all, of course from the US and, and Japan. And electronics uh, was actually the, the biggest uh, sector for a long time uh, by far. Uh, we have, Tijuana at, at one point was considered the, the capital of the TV manufacturing of, of the world. Now it's still a big player, um, just Samsung, like in particular, they're doing 17 million television sets a year. I mean, that's the largest production facility they have in the world, and that they serve all of the uh, America's market through this uh, facility. And it's just amazing to see how quickly they're just, you know, cranking them out. Just a large, you know, 80-inch TV is just coming out uh, like every second. So it is, it is kind of a, an amazing operation. So. All this manufacturing, yeah, of course, as I said, requires supplies, requires uh, materials, components, and that's uh, one of the opportunities that we have as a region as we work together is to try to find and develop uh, suppliers for all of these types of materials. You know, just you know, by sector, you can see the size in, in electronics, $6.5 billion of imports uh, from materials, and it, most of it is coming outside of the region. So there are opportunities just a few miles away. Uh, another phenomenon that's going on is uh, that it, a lot of the manufacturing companies are moving to the outsourcing model. They're, they're not doing the manufacturing themselves. Uh, innovation is uh, uh, at such a rapid pace that they need to focus on that and servicing their customers. And really, the manufacturing is being outsourced to a third party. Uh, but that gives us an opportunity because as, as a region, uh, we have those capabilities. We have the infrastructure, we have the, the, the experience in the workforce, we have the management, we have the engineering. So we can supply that kind of, you know, Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan. That's really how they became uh, such a strong economy is they started off with uh, outsourcing and, and doing contract manufacturing. Now they have their own brands and their own industry, but they're still very, very strong as a contract manufacturer. The three largest uh, contract manufacturing companies in the world are, are from Taiwan, you know, we've got Foxconn, and it has about uh, a million employees worldwide. So they're, they're, it's very, very big. So as, as we develop these capabilities, we'll be able to do more, more work in the region and attract more investment. This is also something important to, to keep in mind in terms of how we uh, do the outsourcing. And it's not just uh, doing everything to another part, but actually becoming part of that supply chain. One of the things that has happened is that, like Apple, the case of Apple, you know, they, they do all of their manufacturing in China. You know, everything's done in China. And they've created a very strong network of supplier base in, in Asia, and very little in the Americas. So we gotta try to keep it in the region, 
as you know, one part of the region grows, the other benefits as well. And see, this is the, the kind of the consequence in terms of innovation. Now, this is the number of patents and uh, utility models, trade secrets uh, developed around the world. And you can see China just is really uh, multiplying much, much faster in terms of uh, new, new intellectual property and new, new, new innovations that are coming out to the market. So those skill sets, we want to keep them in the region. We're working, working together as a, in a co-innovation environment. And some companies are doing it um, and at, all, at all levels. You have large companies like Plantronics. This is a Silicon Valley uh, company uh, that has had manufacturing operations in Tijuana for over 40 years. And now they have uh, about 10 years with their engineering department. And they're doing a lot of co-development and co-engineering with their um, Santa Cruz office. This, uh, this product in particular was developed in the Tijuana facility and was uh, awarded um, in, at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas as one of the most innovative products in the show. DJO, which is a local company here in San Diego, it's a, you know, uh, medical devices. This uh, brace, knee brace that they developed um, is made with nano uh, particulates of magnesium. So they're doing you know, new materials, uh, more high tech uh, innovations and also you know, they're, they're becoming a leader in that and they was also developed with uh, engineers in, in their Mexican facility. And in the more entrepreneurial side, you've probably heard of the story of 3D Robotics. This is uh, a drones company, uh, uh, you know, a Tijuana entrepreneur that partnered up with uh, a guru from Silicon Valley you know, with uh, Chris Anderson and they, they joint ventured and have developed this company that has a facility here in San Diego and a facility in Tijuana. So that kind of co-innovation and collaborative efforts are making you know, more competitive companies at all levels. In terms of the new infrastructure that I was mentioning, uh, there's this third border crossing, the Old Time Mesa 2, and there's, they just broke ground in the construction of the road that will connect uh, to that border crossing. It's a big, big project, and um, probably it'll take about three years to complete, or more. Uh, and the other pro project I was mentioning is the binational air airport terminal. And this is a project that at least 15 years ago was, uh, tr was started to be promoted as a concept. And this is the Tijuana airport, and the only thing they're doing is they're going to build a bridge that crosses over to the U.S. side, a pedestrian bridge. Of course, it'll have all of the customs and border protection and immigration and everything uh, that you would have in, a, in any border crossing. It's a pedestrian border crossing. It just happens to be within the infrastructure of the airport. So anybody that is flying into the Tijuana airport uh, will be able to actually exit um, or ingress the, the airport through the, the U.S. side without having to you know, cross the border uh, by transportation and then all of the logistics. It'll simplify a lot of the process. Right now, about a third of the users of the Tijuana Airport actually come from California. So it's already being used significantly by California residents, but they just have to. So it'll help uh, ease the wait times. You know, there will be less traffic going through the, through the border crossings, and uh, it'll be just more efficient. Now, the Tijuana Airport has about 60% of its capacity uh, being utilized. So there's still a lot of room, and we already have flights to Shanghai and to Tokyo. Uh, with this terminal, it might become more attractive for other, uh, like Korean, maybe a Korea Air, a flight to Seoul, maybe a, a flight to Singapore, and just have more options uh, the, of flights, international flights to the Pacific. You know, San Diego just started last year uh, a flight to Tokyo. Um, with Japan Airlines, and it's become very successful. So there's a lot more opportunities. And, and really, uh, air connectivity has become one of the most important factors in uh, economic development and in attracting investment and developing a region. Um, as you know, more and more uh, we are globalized and we're sharing resources and, and co-innovation concepts. Uh, we need to move quickly and be able to come in and out. So having more infrastructure like this in the region really helps us uh, become more competitive and more attractive. And that's it for me. So I'll open it up for, for questions. Yes. I'm involved in some of the things that you do. I'm a U.S. manufacturer of textile products. 
that uses uh, assembly plants in Tecate, Mexico. One of my challenges is that rule of origin for a certain, uh, a lot of my items coming from China. I know that Mexico does a lot of assembly work. It gets components from all over the world. What is Mexico doing to have actual companies make the raw materials so that I don't have to buy uh, Chinese goods, that I can buy maybe the Mexican raw material and, and use it in my NAFTA? Do you know anything about Well, in, 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 in the textile industry or the apparel industry in Baja California, there's very little going on. And, and you're one of the few. That are, uh, some of it has come, is coming back, but very more specialized, uh, uh, not in the, the massive mass production of apparel. Uh, at one point, we used to be one of the primary uh, manufacturers of, of uh, G-binds, of denim. Uh, denim. Um, but now um, it has gone more uh, into the south of Mexico. And I don't know if you've uh, tried to look for vendors in Guadalajara and in the Bajio area. I know there's a lot more you know, being done there, especially in, in in um, synthetic fibers, you know, and, uh, but um, there's no mills or large mills that are, that are being uh, created. Uh, even though Mexicali is a producer of cotton, uh, but I haven't, haven't heard of any projects uh, for that industry. In general terms, um, there's incentives and there's uh, some government grants for supplier development. So there are some resources available for companies that want to become suppliers of multinational companies and there's, so there's lower cost financing, there's some grants for technology development, um, and there's and some support from the government uh, focused on developing suppliers for the multinational manufacturers. But uh, in the textile, uh, at least in Baja, I haven't heard any particular projects. Yes? Um, with all of the manufacturing that's coming, uh, obviously that also involves a flow of people crossing the border. And I know that there's lots of infrastructure projects in terms of expanding the border right now in order to alleviate the long border waits. But have you heard of a specific goal in terms of what our ideal border crossing time frame is, you know, long term? Yes, the border, uh, the, the border officials or the, the Customs and Border Protection Agency uh, estimates that with uh, the whole project in San Isidro, when, com when completed, uh, they should be around the 20, 25 minute time, time frames. Uh, for the sentry lane, which is, this, is for the commuters that are uh, coming back and forth, and I don't know, is everybody familiar with sentry? No? Well, most of you are. The, this is a, a border crossing um, card that is for frequent, frequent uh, uh, you know, crossing for people that are commuting, and that's about five to 10 minutes. So once you get the sentry lane, um, it really is uh, much quicker. And with uh, the expansion of San Isidro, they're, they're going to go from, I think, 22 lanes uh, to 26 right now and probably another seven uh, in, the, in, the, in the third phase. So they're, they're, you know, they're expanding significantly the number of lanes. All of the lanes are now going to be double stacked. So that gives another 30 percent uh, more uh, productivity or efficiency. And all of them are uh, RFID uh, enabled. And uh, most of the passport cards, uh, if, you know, if you've seen them uh, or gotten the passport card, uh, they're all RFID uh, enabled as well. That helps document quicker, and that is also reducing some of the wait lines. Um, still, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, alert, alertness. You know, the, the, the psyche is that you know, there's still a menace of... Uh, uh, you know, terrorism and things like that. So security has is continued to be a priority. And um, what they're trying to do is balance the, the security with the, fl the, the free flow of people and of goods. You know, I mean, goods is very, very important as well. Um, in the commercial crossing, there's been delays up to five, six, ten, seven hours. So that's a, that could be a big problem. And uh, there's also like a sentry lane for the trucks. Most of those, uh, a lot of the larger manufacturing companies apply for that, that is called uh, the CityPAT, and the logistics group <laughs> will know a lot, a lot about that. But it's also like a sentry, but for trucks. And, uh, and, and when they go through that line, it's only half an hour, 40 minutes for the commercial trucks. So that's a very uh, good program for that. Yes? 
What is the uh, commercial air shipping out of Tijuana Airport looking like? Does it look like it's going to expand with the uh, improvements that are going on down there? Well, with uh, there, there, there is cargo uh, out of the Tijuana Airport, mainly for uh, the interior of Mexico, not not international. Uh, a little bit goes with in the belly of the planes when they go to Asia, but it's small, so it more like parcels, you know, more like a FedEx and things like that. Um, there's a large facility at the, the Tijuana Airport called uh, Matrix, Matrix, that is a maintenance and repair facility. But that has been targeted uh, in several locations uh, as a potential cargo terminal. And that could really change the dynamics. But um, it's still being talked about. There, there isn't, there's no um, that significant you know, projects going on at this point. But on the US side, on the Brownfield, uh, Brownfield Airport is the, the airport strip that is in Otay Mesa, if you're not familiar with it. But there's an airport there. And it's primarily for civil uh, aviation. And that is being converted and or expanded to be a cargo, a cargo facility. And that's, uh, I forget the name of the project, you remember? No. It's International Cargo Terminal, something <laughs> in, in Otay Mesa. But uh, because it, it hasn't really taken off, it's still kind of in the early stages of development of the project. But on the US side, there'll be that facility. And that will help a lot of the high tech products um, and the manufacturing in the region. Like, you know, so the, in terms of electronics, some of the electronic components that are very small, the very, very high value added, that could be coming out of that from there. Uh, a lot of the agro products as well that is being shipped to uh, Asia. Uh, just south of, um, of Rosarito, before you get to Ensenada, uh, there's an area that they're, they're doing a tuna farming. They have huge, uh, like, um, I don't know, nets, I don't know how, how do you say it in English, but it's a big, big, big net in the water and they're farming tuna. And uh, so when they, the tuna grows, they, they take it out of the net and that is being exported by plane directly to Japan, which is then being sold in the, in the farmer's market, in the markets, in the fish market, and auctioned off each tuna. You know, couldn't one, some of those tunas can go up to $5,000, one, one tuna. Uh, so that's an industry that is growing as well in that area. How, how is the, the Calibaja region perceived in Mexico City? Um, they know little about it. Uh, we've tried to <laughs> educate them a lot uh, in several occasions. When we actually, with, with James, uh, there's a annual uh, mission, trade mission, or a more like a lobbying and awareness mission, uh, both to Mexico City or to Washington, D.C. And of course, the, the theme is Calibaja. No? So it, this is every year. Uh, there's so much turnover in, uh, in the officials, in the federal government, that every year you're educating somebody different. Uh, but they're aware. You know, they're aware about our efforts. Um, and actually, um, right now, that Obama is meeting with uh, Peña Nieto, and they're talking about how to, you know, about NAFTA, NAFTA 2.0. How do we really make NAFTA more productive? Yeah, because even though we've increased significantly our trade between us as, and the integration is growing, we're still not leveraging enough our capabilities to compete with other regions. So right now that's part of the discussion and they call it the high level economic dialogue. And within that, uh, there are several initiatives uh, to integrate more uh, our, our economies and our clusters, our uh, industrial clusters. And the first step is really to have uh, information on what's what do we have? What is actually being, uh, right now, being done as, an, as a region? And uh, so as we did this cluster mapping uh, in our uh, region, they're going to do it for the, the, the whole NAFTA region. So for Canada, US, and Mexico, and it's uh, called iClusters Initiative. And they're starting off here in, uh, as a pilot project. They're going to be starting off with the Calibaja region because the, the progress that we have uh, as a region of collaborative effort. So they, they're recognizing, uh, that's a kind of a long way to answer, but uh, they're recognizing the progress that we've made and they use us as an example of collaboration and how we work together as a region uh, on both sides of the border. Um, the El Paso Juarez region also has uh, several initiatives that they work together. 
but not as broad uh, and as, as we do. And of course, their population base is a lot smaller than, than ours. You know, we're six million people as a region, so, it's, so we're, we're a market in itself. Um, yeah, there's three there. We're back in the back first, and then you in the. <laughs> no, you, you, sir. Yeah, with the coat. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you did mention energy, and uh, what's the latest with the, the uh, natural gas port in Ensenada, and what do you think is the potential for energy crossing the border more efficiently in the future as uh, part of either trade or the infrastructure to build uh, uh, the economy of our region? Well, in terms of infrastructure, uh, SEMPRE really did a very good job of building the infrastructure that is required to, for the flow of natural gas between our, and the, the region. And the terminal uh, is uh, in operation. It, you know, it, was, it was built uh, four years ago, something like that. And it, it is in operation. Uh, there's, they are receiving uh, some gas, uh, liquefied gas. And this is, uh, I'm going to go back so everybody understands a little bit. You know, natural gas is, no, is the main fuel for the economy. And uh, it's the cleanest fuel that we have, and it uh, is a main source for, ener for producing energy and for manufacturing. So having natural gas really is an important uh, element of competitiveness. And the idea is that the primary source of gas in, in the US was coming from Texas. So it was being piped to California. It's kind of a long way. And uh, also, uh, we were all, all our eggs were in one basket. So SEMPRA uh, developed, a te they didn't develop the technology, they just developed the infrastructure using a technology that can bring natural gas in a liquid state. When you freeze the, the gas, it really compresses and you can transport it. You can uh, warehouse it and transport it in cryogenic tanks. And so it's a very sophisticated process. But you can bring gas from Alaska and from South Australia and other parts of the world. So you can leverage uh, the cost. Uh, you're not depending on one source. So they build the infrastructure, and it's operating. It's in Ensenada. It's connected to the main pipelines uh, in California uh, through Mexicali and here through Tijuana as well. So the, inter the, the system is well developed, well connected. But the dynamics of natural gas change with shale gas with the, the, the uh, fracking is a new technology to extract the natural gas uh, from rocks. And the price of gas was uh, at $12 a million BTU. Now it's at two and a half dollars. So when the, that price dynamics changed, it really make, doesn't make a lot of sense to bring the liquid, the liquid natural gas. But it is there, it is a resource, just you know, the kind of the, the, the dynamics of the shale gas is still in the works, we don't know how it's going to settle, uh, but I think that gives us leverage of being able to always have a, a secondary source. Now, that is being complemented with a lot of the renewable energy projects. There's a large uh, wind energy project in uh, the Baja Sierra, the Sierra in Baja, el Col uh, Sierra Juarez, um, La Rumorosa. In case uh, maybe some of you are familiar, but this is the the main mountain ridge between uh, the coastline and the desert. And uh, there's uh, enough capacity that they're having, they're developing uh, of wind energy there to provide energy to most of Southern California. So it's, it's a very, very big project uh, of developing uh, wind turbines in that area. It is considered one of the most uh, productive wind energy uh, regions in the world. Um, so it's going to be uh, a, a natural, you know, resource for the region. And uh, there's also some solar projects in Imperial Valley. They're doing a lot of the solar. They have um, thermosolar and they have uh, photovoltaics uh, also as well. But the thermal solar is kind of the big uh, thing, big push in, um, in the Imperial Valley. So in terms of energy, well, we're going to have enough energy in the region to fuel our growth. And, and it should be at competitive cost. That, that's going to be an asset for the region. Yes? You mentioned what was happening in Tijuana with the uh, airport and the bridge connecting. Um, do you know what's happening on the US side? Are there hotels? Are there uh, taxi ports? Are there well, the, on the US side, they're going to build a terminal like the ones you see here, right? the full terminal. And it's going to have all the infrastructure typical of a airport terminal of uh, public transportation, the uh, restaurant services, whatever. And there's land available 
for other developments uh, are surrounding. Uh, not a lot uh, in adjacent to, to the terminal uh, because it's mostly industrial space around that area. There's a lot of warehouses and a lot of uh, you know, industrial facilities. And, uh, but the brownfield terminal is just like uh, two miles away. So it's very close and be interconnected. And the brownfield terminal does have a lot more commercial uh, uh, land use available within the, the facilities of the, the brownfield. So it all can tie together and it really be very attractive. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with um, the Millennia project of uh, the Macmillan Company. In the east end of Chula Vista, which is the second largest city in San Diego, you know, in case you don't know. Um, all of that area is being developed and there's a very large um, uh, commercial real estate project by the Macmillan Company called Millennia and that'll, that'll have a, a lot of office space and you know, campus type uh, infrastructure for corporations. They'll have housing and uh, there's, there's just a lot of infrastructure being developed there. And just next to it is a, what they call the university um, condominium type of uh, uh, development. So they're gonna, what they're going to do is uh, develop uh, an area there in Chula Vista in East Lake where they can have like satellite uh, uh, representations of different universities from, from other parts of the U.S. and uh, the world and kind of have a campus of different universities that, that have a presence there and they can you know, uh, collaborate. And, I mean, so a lot of things are going on in the East Lake area of Chula Vista as well. Do yes. Know if, um, any of the manufacturers that come from overseas to this region um, come with um, projects, I guess, around the corporate social responsibility projects in mind, specifically for the people within the region and beyond employment? Yeah. They're very active in general. Um, and one of the areas that I've seen the most is uh, very focused on the quality of life of their employees. And there's a company here in the U.S. that has a program called Great Place to Work. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But what they do is they, they certify companies in terms of the opinion of the employees of uh, the environment they're working on. And uh, you know, they vote in terms of you know, how well they're treated and how they're developed. And that has become one of the main uh, uh, attract uh, uh, objectives of those multinational companies to become certified with a uh, great place to work. And uh, DJO Global, which is I uh, mentioned a little while ago, has won first place at the national level in Mexico. Plantronics has won first place several times at the national level. Uh, this is a, a ranking that is being done in all Mexico. So we're getting a lot of that focus, and uh, a lot of it is being fo uh, done to, for the human development and social development of the employees. Uh, that said, they also participate actively in the children's hospital. Uh, that is one of the projects that is very uh, uh, attractive to some of the multinational companies. Um, they all, there's a cancer center called uh, uh, Castro Limon, La Fundación Castro Limon. They're also one of the the main uh, recipients of, uh, of support. Um, a lot of environmental uh, education projects as well. So I think they're very active socially in, uh, in looking for uh, improvements in the community as well. As you said in the beginning, uh, one of the key success of the Calibaja region is NAFTA, basically free trade. What is your opinion on the Mexican uh, uh, proposal of economic reform, which is putting on risk this free trade, trade or what they call the temporary importation? Well, I think there's some misinformation there. Um, the, the, re the fiscal reform that was enacted last year uh, affecting uh, the operations of multinational companies doing manufacturing is related to the sales tax and the ability to not pay the sales tax on the imports of raw materials and machinery that is going to be that it would be compensated when you export so uh, the federal government had given this uh, a credit tax credit 
to those companies uh, so they don't have to pay that uh, tax because if, when they're going to export, they're going to get it back anyway. So they thought that they should do it. They, they shouldn't do, be doing that, and they should be charging the sales tax and then giving it back. But they've realized that it doesn't make a lot of sense, that it's going to be just more overhead, more, uh, more work for the federal government itself uh, in, in, in exchange of what they could be uh, recuperating if um, for those companies that have been importing and not exporting. You know, they were importing without paying the tax and never really exported. So there was some of that going on, but it was primarily a more in the interior of Mexico that that phenomenon was going on, and of companies that are more service-oriented, that are not actually doing the manufacturing. So they were importing products for, for the market as a, as, a maqui, as a maquiladora and weren't really exporting. So that kind of, that's why they did it, but that's uh, the only real uh, change. The impact of that is that if they do that, which it looks like they're not going to do it, um, it will have a burden on their administrative processes, you know, because they'll have to very well document what is being paid and what they're going to be trying to recuperate when they export uh, the product. So it's just a burden, administrative burden, and a financial burden in terms of being, financing that uh, cash uh, uh, payment and then trying to recuperate it. It could be six months you know, before they can get it back. So there's a financial cost of, of that capital. Uh, but uh, thankfully, I think they've, they've understood that it didn't really make sense. And what they're doing is they're creating a mechanism to certify the, uh, those companies that are, that are doing their job well and are doing things correctly, and they're going to give them that tax credit as always. So, the miscommunication and the misinformation is really what has maybe hurt us because the companies are like waiting and seeing what's going to happen. Um, and, but in reality, we haven't seen any companies canceling their investments or their expansions. Right now, there's a lot of expansion going on in Tijuana. There's uh, um, Zodiac, which is a French company that does interiors of airplanes uh, for uh, Bombardier and for Embraer and other companies, uh, just doubled their capacity uh, in, in this last month. There's a large um, company from the East Coast called their Surgical Specialties that is opening up in Tijuana next month. And so there's a lot of, a lot of new investment going on. Uh, that we didn't see in, 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 the, in the crisis years, you know, to 2009, 2010, we didn't see a lot of new investment. Mostly was just kind of um, expansion of uh, some of the operations that we had, but now we're seeing it back again. Yes? So the, the region is very dynamic, and so as it's expanding because of manufacturing, it also receiving, it's also receiving a lot of uh, deported migrants. So how is that, um, can the manufacturing, growing manufacturing be a solution for all the undocumented migrants being deported to the border region? Yeah, would, that, uh, would there be a kind of um, teaching or would they learn the skills they need to be to work in the industry? Is that something that has been considered at all? It, yes, it has been considered. Um, there's, uh, there's a couple of programs uh, with, between the federal government, the state and local government uh, to offer the opportunity for those ex uh, deported uh, migrants to go into a training program and be able to, to obtain work. Um, it hasn't been very well received from the migrants, unfortunately. Very few have signed up for the program. Um, other programs are really to offer them the transportation to their, na to their uh, native uh, town. Um, most of those migrants are not from Baja California. You know, they're, they're from other parts of Mexico and sometimes Central America. So <laughs> some Central Americans are also being de deported from, uh, f through, through San Isidro. And um, so they have to be uh, transported to, to their locations. And, and a lot of them just uh, are staying and thinking of maybe coming back to the U.S. some way. Uh, it is a, uh, a social problem for the city because we did get a, uh, an influx uh, last year. I think it was about 80,000 people that were deported from, and a lot of them without any documents, a lot of them without any contacts, without any money. 
So you know they're just <laughs> dumping him there, and, uh, and there's very little capacity to absorb them in shelters and things like that. So it has created some uh, social problems, but there's several programs now in place. It took a while you know, to get the federal funding and, and all that, but now there's several mechanisms to deal with those. And uh, also they've reduced now the number of deportations through San Isidro. They're spreading them out <laughs> throughout the border. <laughs> I think we're running out of time, right? I don't know. One more, a few more? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm, uh, thank you for your interesting speaking. I learned a lot. Uh, I am interested in the outsourcing center you mentioned. Yes. You said Hong Kong, Taiwan, they were the ones like an uh, outsourcing center, and then they became rich, they invest in China, and China turned up. But one thing is different in Mexico because uh, <coughs> it's so close to, to America. Uh, the, other, the other thing that the, lots of people uh, from Cali, Baja, they are not local people. They are from like South Mexico or everywhere in the, in the Middle America, South America. Uh, after they getting rich, they will send their uh, children to study in the U.S. They will invest in the U.S. So this is the problem that not will happen in Taiwan or Hong Kong. So some local people said <coughs> this really hurts the economy of Tijuana, because people getting rich, they move to U.S. So what's your opinion about this problem? Hmm. Well, I don't think it's a pro uh, an, an issue that is new or that it's uh, gonna, going to be a consequence of the Calibaja initiative. It's, something, it's a phenomenon that's been going on for, I mean, I guess from the very beginning of, uh, of the growth of Tijuana uh, and uh, of San Diego. Uh, most families, I, I know a lot of the families have, uh, from Tijuana have had uh, part of their family in, in uh, San Diego and part of their assets in San Diego and in Tijuana. Uh, what I'm seeing more is now more U.S. residents are uh, establishing assets in Mexico and buying homes. And you know, the coastline between Tijuana and Ensenada, the you know, same ocean as here in, in, in California, and you can buy a house for a tenth of the price. You know, if a house in La Jolla would be at least $3 million, and you can buy the same house on the beach for $300,000 in, in Rosarito or in uh, some beach. So there's, there's the flow going both ways. And I think um, the education of uh, a lot of people also, is also becoming more binational, and investments are being done in, in both areas. It, it's not something that has really impacted because of economic growth. Uh, there, there was uh, more of that going on when we had some problems with security about a few, it's five years ago, uh, when the federal government started really to combat the, the, the cartels and the, then there was a migration of a lot of families from Tijuana and, and brought some of their assets to San Diego and invested in San Diego. And so you see in, in the South Bay area, there's a few restaurants that are from Tijuana families uh, so you don't have to go to Tijuana to get some of that Mexican food. <laughs> but um, I think it, it's, it's not something that really is hurting the economy. It's a phenomenon that has been going on for, for many years, and it has been part of our, the organic growth of the region. And then another side of it is that a lot of the, the, those multinational companies that manufacture in, in Baja, most of their executives actually live in San Diego, and they commute every day to Tijuana. Um, East Lake area of Chula Vista has a lot of those uh, executives. A lot of the Japanese executives live in that area. There are several golf courses there. They, they have a Japanese school in the, in, in, on uh, Saturdays for their children. Um, so it's really part of that uh, integration of the region and really complements each other. I think we are yeah, I think we're out of time. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Really informative. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Glad to be here.